that was the 90s? Oh, probably, yes. yeah. Mm. Late the 90s rather than the 80s. Right? Yeah, so a long time ago. Yeah, yeah. Um, so Stephen is actually, he's one of the artists in the CAS collection that I talked about um, last week. And I'm very interested to hear about what he's got to say. So I'll hand over to you. Um, ah, Peter Bales is coming. I'll hand over to you, um, Stephen, and uh, 10 minutes or so. Right, okay, well, I'll try and stick to uh, the time I'm given. I'm gonna share the screen and hopefully it'll all work properly. Um, so let's make sure that's working. No, I wanna go on this one. Right, hopefully people can see this. Uh, My screen just went funny. Right. I've got your presentation. Is that, um, which looks okay to me. Yeah. That's what I'm hoping to see. It should say Stephen Bell and some other stuff. Yeah. Okay. I'll assume people can see this and get started. Mm. Okay. Today I'm going to share with you a shape generation technique uh, that has fascinated me for about four decades. Um, I call it mapping behavior. Uh, if there's time, I'll show you some examples of earlier work. Uh, that you can also find on my website, uh, which you can see the address for down the bottom left there. Uh, I discovered after a few years working with this system, I'm going to show you that I began to see animal behavior differently. Now I can spend ages watching the dance-like flight of gnats and midges. I see the growth of plants differently. Uh, I see the consequences of social distancing at the moment like a macabre dance choreographed by polity. The work has enabled me to bring a degree of order to my reading of what we were previously confusing phenomena, complex phenomena. I also wonder how much I'm projecting order onto things. Now I'm going to try and try a live demo now. That shouldn't have happened. Uh, <coughs> just get out of here. Right. Okay. What I'm going to do, you should now be seeing, hopefully, uh, some code. Yeah. So I'm going to run this. And this is uh, some software I use, which I wrote a while back, uh, which I call Small World. Um, and what I'm going to do is just release a few individual, what I call creatures, other people would call them agents into the space. And they're moving out and filling. They're trying to get an optimum distance from each other. Uh, we can actually look at the trails they've made. Um, you can see that it's actually in 3D. Uh, and if I move where I'm locating these new individuals, we get them moving around in 3D. If I pause it and stop them moving around and put a few things in which are like resources that they might find interesting uh, <coughs> and let them start moving again, we'll find they all move towards the resources. Uh, if we get rid of the trails again, you get a better idea of what's going on. We get a kind of three-dimensional Voronoi distribution when they're all trying to get into the same place. I was really pleased that I got that. Um, what else can we do? Yeah, so once they're rest, when they're restful like this, uh, if we put in some resources again, it wakes them all up. So that is something I developed back in about 1984. And I'm just going to give you a brief idea of um, how I got to where I am now. So let's see if we can get back to the other screen. Yep. Uh, let's see. Play again. Yeah, here we are. Righto. So in the 1970s, uh, I'd become interested in minimalist and procedurally generated music and visual art. I was also interested in human interaction, rituals, and participatory art and how social interactions, including games between people constrained by simple rules could be lead to endless permutations. Uh, you can probably guess who, which artists work had influenced me back then. Um, at the Slade from 1977 to 79, I found that programming 
provided a way to generate compositions of shapes and patterns that had a simple underlying rule system, yet would produce complex patterns and forms. So back in the 70s, late 70s, one of the things I was doing here was using random numbers to generate shapes. You'll see it has a lot of familiarity with work which was done in the previous 10 years. But what I did was I added a brush and colored brushes and I used CMYK colors so that uh, I got a broader range <coughs> of colors than we got uh, by people using plotters at the time. Um, Nineteen eighty-four to eighty-five, I managed to get a, a, an artist residency at the University of Kent at Canterbury, as it was then, in the computing lab. And I'd been exploring systems-based art at the Slade, and really enjoyed the principle that the system used to generate a work could potentially be recovered from it. I share a fascination with many computer art society members with how a simple proposition or algorithm can create subtle patterns and intriguing compositions. During the residency, I thought that while number patterns and geometrical compositions mean something to us, it doesn't to most people. They're not really very interested if, if you derive what's in it in something and find maths. Um, so I thought, what else might be interesting to people? I also felt that if all you recovered was randomness, which is what I've been using before, that's also pretty empty. So considering alternatives that explored similar ideas, I thought about people really connect with animal behaviors. In fact, it's common to all humans. Um, I did some experiments based on animal behavior and it led to engaging results like the sort of thing you can see here. Um, an ethologist I knew um, who didn't know what I was doing actually recognized the predator prey behavior that I generated using my code. And it convinced me I got it right. I felt also that the work related to Scandinavian and Anglo-Saxon zoomorphic art. So there was a kind of precedent. I could only do still images when I was at um, the University of Kent, uh, but when I moved to Loughborough to do a PhD with Susan Tebby and Ernest Edmonds, um, I was able to use, I was lucky enough to be able to use uh, silicon graphics machines, which um, John Walden brought in as part of his uh, VR research project, I actually helped set them up, which was fun. Um, and that allowed me to do work that could be inter interacted with in exhibitions. The picture at the bottom left is in Utrecht, the, the first I see it. Um, so I was able to explore the possibilities. Um, what I'm doing now, um, at the interview for the residency in the University of Kent, I actually talked about VR, although it wasn't around at the time. It was being used by the military and so on. And I said that I wanted to find out what kind of artificial environments we would be able to explore when the technology eventually became widely available. I'm currently making a version of my software, which I call Small World, using Unity so I can expand it into VR and actually realize a project I proposed in the mid 90s, this thing here, the virtual reality aesthetic programming interface. Um, and that's what I'm working on now. And that's it, folks. Uh, any questions? Um, I, I read you used Seagull from uh, Bournemouth. No. You didn't? Oh, OK. No, I, um, I did for one image. Um, I output data from this software, uh, the Small World software, and Peter Komninos, um wrote some software to convert it so it would actually be rendered. <coughs> OK. For a little while, but he was very cagey about letting me look at the code. And uh, <laughs> that was a bit disappointing because I'd have liked mm. to write my own plugins. But um, sure, so sure. I gave it a try. But you're right. I did use it. I, mm. I definitely used Seagull. Yeah. Oh, interesting. Lovely renderer. It looked really beautiful. Yeah, we, I used to work at Sheffield Art College, uh -huh. uh, Salter Lane, and we had uh, 12 machines with Seagull on oh. and various other modelers and things. So I got, did a bit of work in it then. Mainly, as you say, just for rendering. You could code things and then render them and animate, but it was yeah, very much it, that it side of it. The students to have to code using. Of course, you couldn't get anything done without coding then. It was really useful. Cool to... Yeah, it was very high level language. It's all like, you know. I'd try to encourage Peter to make it a, uh, you know, an independent language, scripting language uh, that, that could be used elsewhere, but he, 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 he didn't go down that route. No, no. <laughs> Yeah. Language. Oh, interesting. What VR work are you doing now? 
Um, I'm not into VR yet. Um, oh, this I, Unity. I actually yeah. chased up. I tried at the first, you know, VR permutation. I went along to Division and approached all sorts of different people saying you need a, you need a killer app and I've got it but they weren't interested unfortunately yeah. so I never got the chance but so, I've been waiting until I've I retired recently so I've now got the time to put the effort into mm. getting it working mm. uh, I, found, I found that the academic demands of I was just saying to uh, Sean earlier having to having to learn new new programming languages every few years and new systems as we're teaching at into my time so I only mm -hmm. had a few weeks each year mm. to do my own work now I'm retired and I can work on it better so sure. I'm I'll get I'll actually achieve this Mm. Yeah. All these okay. uh, maybe a quick um, question from me is that when do you expect some of this stuff maybe to be usable or in, out in the open as it were um, well I'm hoping I can get a non-VR version working this year that I can distribute because it's easy it's cross-platform so yeah. anybody will be able to have a go on it yeah. uh, and I'll probably release it as uh, freeware with you know extras if people want to buy in and, and I might do a kickstarter or well, so let, let's have a chat. As, um, I mentioned my son works for a VR development company, so maybe we can get projects together or something like that. It could be cool. Yeah, they're, 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 they're updating how the uh, networking works on Unity. So um, for multi-users, it might take a, a, a year or so until they get settled in on their upgrade. We'll see. Yeah. Uh, yeah, well, thank you very much for that. Um, let's move on um, yeah, to our next speaker, um, who is David Upton. Um, give you the screen back. Oh, thanks. Um, I think David won't be using the screen, but we'll want to have his video, I'm sure. Um, I've known um, David I've a couple of years, maybe a few years, and um, notably he produced um, the series of videos that we have on the um, CAS website, the artist interviews. Um, highly high um, quality um, video. <coughs> but I don't think you're talking about the interviews today. Is that right, David? No, I'm not. No. Um... So, yeah, I'll hand over to you, and again, 10 minutes or so, um, that'll be fine. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, well, thank you, Sean. Thank you, everybody, for giving me an opportunity to talk to you. Um, I've got no artwork or technology to show, and I'm, I'm certainly not brave enough to run my code in public. Um, but I'm just going to talk about some ideas that I'm working on at the moment. Um, the title of this talk is Computational Psychogeography. Um, I must confess, I'd never actually heard of computational psychogeography until I used the term to pitch this talk to Sean. So I may have invented a new discipline, which is, of which I apologise. Um, just for those who, who may not know, psychogeography has been defined by Guy Debord as uh, the study of the precise laws and specific effects of the geographical environment, consciously organised or not, on the emotions and behaviour of individuals. But I don't take that too seriously, because if you put any three psychogeographers in a room together, they'll come up with at least four different definitions of what they're doing. The key points, uh, really, to me, are um, a focus on exploring your physical environment, usually by walking, which is often called a derive or a drift, uh, to, to, get the, to get over the idea that you shouldn't have a logical purpose or a logical plan for what you're doing. Uh, because it's all about seeing things with fresh eyes. And if you have a plan, then you tend to see just what you plan to see. Um, people use various techniques for psychogeography. The, the situationists used to do things like navigating around Paris using a map of Brussels, but perhaps more realistically these days, there's what's called the surveillance camera bingo. When you see a surveillance camera, walk in the direction it's pointing until you see another one and then walk in the direction that one's pointing. Um, my my favourite one actually uh, was a walk around the Yorkshire village of Marsden, uh, led by a man called Marsden, who didn't live there. And the purpose of this was to... Uh, visit the sites of accidents reported over the last 150 years to people called Marsden. I mean, it, it's a little bit goofy, but it's actually, the more you think about it, the more interesting it becomes. Um, computational art is another term that's difficult to pin down. Al almost all artists use computers one way or another these days, I mean, tools like Photoshop and so on. But as we use the term at Goldsmiths, where I'm, I'm currently doing an MA in, in computational art, um, computational means perhaps a closer understanding of the, of the computer, exploring its affordances rather than just getting a software package and, and using it, and finding new ways to uh, use the computer rather than just automating existing practices. Uh, and I mean, it, computational art has made uh, practices very much easier, much more possible. For instance, generative art. Jean Art was doing generative art during the First World War. 
you know, dropping pieces of paper onto uh, onto uh, canvas. But you can now do richer and much more complex things now, as, as Andy Lomas, for instance, has demonstrated. And other te techniques such as virtual reality simply weren't possible before. Um, I first looked at bringing computational technology to psychogeography last year. Um, I went on a, a, a walk, a very challenging walk, where, where I kept, I was haunted by feelings that there were things going on uh, that, that I could partly sense, but I couldn't bring to consciousness. You know, I, I knew that something affected me, but didn't know what it was. And it occurred to me that what I could do is put together a simple um, sensor, a group of sensors based on a Raspberry Pi, and just see if there was anything going on, you know, magnetic flux effects or something like that, that I, I wasn't aware of that might have been affecting me. So last year's fourth World Congress of Psychogeography, I actually pr presented as portable sensor kit. I'm not sure if you can see this, but it's built around a Raspberry Pi and various other bits of kit, um, which you can take with you. It takes GPS uh, readings uh, and uh, rather like Steam, you know, it's plotting a, a journey though a journey in the physical world. And at the same time, it's plotting the measurements it's taking. Um, and then that way you can print the data out in spreadsheets and you can try and see if there are any anomalies that are interesting. I won't go into details because I haven't really got time, but it, it has thrown up one or two interesting things so far. It's still very much an ongoing program. Um, but everything's been influenced by the coronavirus crisis. And we're having another fourth world congress on, on psycho psychogeography in September. It's, it's all in joke. It's always the fourth world congress because the user, the uh, organising committee forgets to close it at the end. Um, and I'm, I'm actually on the organising committee, and we're apparently wrestling with the problem how to hold a conference when we may be unable to do various things. We may be able to walk. We may be able to, unable to gather people together, uh, and worst of all, the pubs will close in the evenings. Um, so that's the negative aspect. I mean, it's why we're meeting tonight on Zoom. And we could do that for our, con for our conference, uh, the, the psychogeographical conference. But I want to look at it as a more, in a more positive way and say, what can we do? What new affordances can we take from things like Zoom or things like uh, Microsoft Teams or that sort of software to make, to deepen and extend the practice of psychogeography in some way? Um, so I'm asking myself, what can we do now that we couldn't do five years ago um, and I'm hoping that uh, I've been reading a lot of Roy Ascot recently, and he is making the point that, you know, you can you can do this sort of thing and somehow build an artwork out of it, not just a machine to facilitate people talking to each other, but build a kind of artwork out of the whole thing. Though in what way, I'm not sure. Um, I'm thinking something which would be a behavioral shared artwork, which looks at the actions and the decisions, the things that people see, the things that people, the places people go adds some generative inputs from the technology possibly, uh, exposes the results to the participants, perhaps as augmented reality, incorporates their feedback and then cycles on until it finally produces or becomes an artwork of some sort. Uh, and what I'm trying to find out at the moment is how to share consciousness across space so that several people can experience things together even though they're physically far apart. And there's quite a long line of, of works doing this, you know, going back to the 90s or something like that. Uh, though in, in increasingly uh, increasingly more technical ways. And for practical reasons, it, it seemed best to try and concentrate on building the whole thing in smartphones because everybody's got one of those, whereas people haven't got Raspberry Pis or augmented reality glasses or things like that. And I've been looking in particular at video streams, location data, collecting data from other sensors. Now, there are problems about this because, of course, what I'm building is surveillance technology. And obviously, the... Um, the technology, the uh, Android and all these things uh, have various barriers, so you can't do that, quite rightly. But what I want to devise is, is one that people can use knowing what's going on and accepting this and welcoming it, in fact, that they are generating a trail as, as, as they go uh, and being happy with this. After all, people put um, Alexas in their homes and this is effectively bugging yourself 24 hours a day. Um, but interestingly, the, the challenge doesn't seem to lie very much, as much in the technology, difficult though that is sometimes, as in deciding what data to collect and share and what to do with it and how to make some sort of finished product out of it. Um, psychogeography, it's really an ideal testing ground for, for, for such a concept. I mean, you, you find the, the early history of, of people dealing with this kind of social art, people like Stephen Willis or... or um, uh, uh, Roy Astor, but they were trying to think of situations and trying to build uh, situations in which people got together and did things. 
psychogeographers get together and do things anyway. They, they, they act semi-independently within loose rules. As I say, the rules may be very loose indeed. Uh, we, we may all basically agree to move around for the same period of time, uh, often moving according to novel counterintuitive or downright stupid systems. We may do this together or separately in different countries, sometimes traditionally all in the same place, but you know, it doesn't have to be. And as Roy Ascot said somewhere, the, the, the process becomes as important or more important than any resulting artifact. I'm still not quite sure what that means. So to, to, to end with a, with a French sociologist, um, Foucault talked about technologies of the self. And he said that technologies of the self permit individuals to effect by their own means or with the help of others, a certain number of operations on their own bodies and souls. Um, and I see psychogeography in a way as a kind of technology of the self. It enables you to help yourself to see things in a different way, to be aware of different things as, as you walk around. It's almost like a kind of meditation in a way. Um, and I'm hoping that I can somehow enhance this. Uh, Foucault did say that uh, the, the benefit of technologies of self uh, was to transform yourself in order to attain a certain state of happiness purity, wisdom, perfection, or immortality. Uh, I'm not quite sure that we can do that with psychogeography, but what I'm really trying to do is identify sub-technologies, things I can do with a, with, a, with a Raspberry Pi or a mobile phone, in order to help my fellow psychogeographers attain happiness, purity, and wisdom, and possibly not immortality. So that's where I am at the moment. That's, that's, that's what I'm working on. And this is very much just a, a sort of work in progress discussion. Thank you. <laughs> Interesting, and maybe a quick question if anybody has one. Um, oh, Steve, you've um, grabbed my attention first, Stephen Bell. You'll need to unmute yourself. So, um, yeah, I was in, I was actually just applauding, but I was very intrigued by the notion of the technology and the the, the, the method changing the way you perceive yourself, because I think that's that's mm. one of the things that. Um, is very important about the impact of this technology on all of us, mm. uh, and, and deliberately investigating it is. Uh, mm. have, have you got any evidence, David, that, that kind of suggests that, that, that it does actually work? Um, well, the scheme works as I, 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 I want to do it. And I've tried one or two very very basic things, which aren't good enough to show you, and, and they they do seem to be allowing this sort of communication. But that's just a matter of mastering the Android system in terms of the psychological effect. I mean, there, there is quite a lot. Uh, you, you, I mean, about, about 20 years ago, there, there was a, an artwork whose name I can't remember, in which people sat on two sofas, geographically separated. And the people who sat, two people sat at one end of one sofa, and two people sat at the other of the other sofa. And then they were projected as though they were sitting on the same sofa together. That's German's work, yeah. Yeah, and apparently this had quite a, a, a psychological, a strong effect on people. They got really cross, you know, the people on the other end pushed into them or something, even though they were 100 miles away. And I think uh, there is evidence that, that social interaction and, and, and the emotion that comes with it, uh, it doesn't necessarily depend on things being actually physically present. Mm. That's great. Great. Well, thank you very much. Um, there will be a, potentially a little bit of time at the end for any other questions if people have them. Otherwise, I think we should move on to our next speaker, who's Jeff Davis. Um, I think Jeff's going to probably talk about his current work, but also some historic work. Um, yeah. Hello, everyone. Thanks, John, <laughs> oh, hello, for the introduction. Um, well, actually, I think because it's such a short uh, period available, I focused more on micro arts, which is going to go into the um, Computer Arts Society archive, apparently. So that's very good news, to, you know, very exciting. Um, my own work is sort of ongoing, so I'll maybe talk about that some other time, but I haven't really, I'm working on things at the moment, so I don't really want to talk about those just yet. Um, so for the people that don't know, Micro Arts, um, I set up in the 1984. I just whizzed through my notes. Uh, we produced a range of uh, computer graphics and art for um, what were new newish home micros such as the ZX Spectrum, uh, the BBC Micro. Hang on, the light's a bit funny. Um, it was produced uh, by sort of practitioner artists, I suppose, rather than people that were, were professional artists or working in academia. Um, and it was aimed to go out to the general public um, as a kind of like a 
my background at the time, uh, I'd worked with bands and things in Sheffield. Uh, I was involved with London Video Arts and London Filmmakers Co-op in the mid 80s. Um, so that was kind of my social background. So I wanted to set up a computer arts organisation that was sort of grassroots and aiming at the public, really. And there was nothing around like it because Computer Arts Society had stopped doing anything at that point. And I probably wouldn't have found them anyway because I wasn't really looking in academia. Um, so I started this operation off uh, by sort of writing code. I mean, my job at the time was a COBOL programmer. I'd left university in 1980, uh, went to work at in Kingston for Surrey County Council uh, on a Univac mainframe and I was writing COBOL using a pencil on paper and this whole sort of system at the time. I'd left all that and I was having some time off. So I started MicroArts and um, got some friends involved who were artists. Some were working with computers. Some were working with uh, Paintbox. Quantal was out, I think, at the time. There was a French friend who was working with photo images. So we put together this project and I kind of did most of the work, to be honest. Uh, and we had four releases of software on cassettes and um, a magazine, a print magazine, which uh, came with <coughs> it. Now these cassettes were a mixture of algorithmic art, which was um, which I show actually. If I can figure out how to do it. Where is it now? Share screen. Okay. Let's start with this one. Now this one was there were two releases that were algorithmic, um, one for the Spectrum, one for the BBC. And it had a kind of menu system so users could control it and change colours and speed and so on. And the idea was really that it was making art, but it could be used as background graphics. That was the kind of idea in the, the sort of marketing idea, if you like. Uh, that we never sold very many, but the idea was that people would buy this for their micros and then run them on their TV sets and have all this interesting background stuff going on. And the, uh, I, I whiz it along a bit if I can figure out how to do it. There we are. Um, this blue, this cyan is a very nice color, I think. It's quite attractive at this point. It blends from one system in one algorithmic, one algorithm into the next. So then the next one comes along. I just jump ahead a bit. There's that one. So then you might get a different one altogether. Now this one's a bit slower. Some were slower than others. There's a few things going on there. Uh, so this program was made to loop so you could leave it running in the background and you know that'd be nice ambient art uh, i quite enjoyed coding all these and um some are more attractive than others but some print up really well i think you know as, as proper art images they do look some of them look better than others others it's all basic 8-bit stuff now other ones we had we did a more um apart from these two programs Martin Roots, a friend of mine who worked on graphics for the Hacienda in Manchester Club and the Lead Mill in Sheffield. He did you know, um, signs and things for them at that time. But he worked on some BBC micro graphics, which I don't have on this machine. Uh, they're on the website, which I'll show you later. We also had um, conceptual pieces. I can find them, which... Uh, hmm. Well, unfortunately, my um, browser seems to have vanished from here. Let me just have a look. Mm, okay, well, we move swiftly on. There were, there were some conceptual pieces. They're on the website. Uh, hang on, how do I get up here? Sorry about this. So I just lost my browser disappeared. But anyway, um, there was a conceptual program called Various Unusual Events, which had uh, very slow art that took two, uh, two years to draw on the screen. Uh, there was math art with uh, code coming up on the screen in a sort of random way. And um, an animation of uh, Scum Manifesto by Valerie Stellanus, who was the woman who shot Andy Warhol and two other people. Uh, but she had a manifesto about uh, ending the money work system. So I did an animation of that, which uh, was on this compilation set of more conceptual works. Um, so all that stuff's on the website. I also did a, a text generation program, 
which hopefully will work. Here we are. Hey, what's going on? Sorry about this, I'm having a trouble trying to, trouble trying to share this stuff. That says I need permission from Sean. I need to give you permission, do I? Um, well, we managed to get one to work. I'm just trying sure, to get yeah, the other sure one. I've seen it, yeah. um, that did appear, actually. It was text on... Um, yeah, I can see it. I can only see the other one. Oh, here we are. Okay. Mm. I just think I've, my, I've got masking going on or something. This one was the fourth release. So there were two algorithmic art, one conceptual, and this one, which is text generation. Now, the reason I'm showing this one is because I'm now working on text generation and machine learning at UAL in London, at Camberwell Art College. I've just started some research work there. Now, this was a text generation. Is that coming up, Sean? That's fine, yeah, I can see it. Yeah, yeah great, okay. This was based on, I also write fiction, and this was based on a short story about mad cow disease, which was a big thing in the 80s. Uh, an epidemic that was transferring from animals to humans, which kind of sounds familiar. So I had a system running which took the original story, then I replaced all of the words with different words. And then the generation system just cycled through and produced different, uh, the sentences were the same structure, but the words changed. It's all at the syntax level. But it did produce lots of interesting stories from this base material. And this was produced for an exhibition at the Filmmakers Co-op and, um, and then came out later it didn't come out as a data cassette, it came out as a, um, came on Prestel because later on we moved on to Prestel, which if anybody, if anybody's old enough to remember, was a teletext system on TVs, which came out, uh, had all sorts of things like the news and weather and so on, uh, sports updates, but it also had a section called Micronet, which had all the computer stuff on. So MicroArts ended up on Micronet on Prestel. Uh, and so we had a magazine, all the articles ended up on there and this software and the other software for people, all free for people to download. So it went on to there and then it, it lasted, a, it all went on for a few years quite happily. Then I went back to work in the end, unfortunately, uh, but whatever, and, and did IBM PC networking at the Prudential in High Holborn, which was the first time they'd ever networked the dealing room, which was quite interesting. So I got interviewed by the press for that. So I sort of spent most of my time in and out of normal computer jobs, really. And then the micro arts in the mid eighties was this uh, sort of range of art activities, really, that was you know, reasonably successful, I think. We had very good reviews in the press. The computer press were sort of either baffled or horrified, but mainly quite positive. So we had some quite good reviews. Um, shall I stop this streaming now? Okay. Go back to me. Um, so really it was, overall, it was very good. I mean, I've got, these are the, for people that haven't seen a data cassette, this is one of the cassettes for MA1. And, you know, the data was on a cassette and it was just converted from audio back into data. Uh, the magazine, which was, there's actually some covers, but it was a magazine, you know, with, with art on the back. So, you know, and it had lots of articles in it. Uh, informative rather than reviews and things. Um, and later on, I did work with uh, on other books I'd done. We had graphics. We had a game on one novel in the 90s, and that ended up on, I don't know whether people remember this, the Arts Council did a multimedia disc in the mid-90s. They had a thing called The Hub that was on there, a game on there I did with a friend. Um, so I've always been doing sort of text and fiction things, really. So the algorithmic art, I always sort of saw it as examples of things rather than fine art and then it was supposed to be used at home as background to your whatever you were doing in the way that people made videos of fish tanks and things so so I didn't have a didn't have a very high art approach to it at the time but it's quite interesting I think from a pure arts uh, background from a pure art background and the way it actually looks because a lot of the algorithmic art does look quite interesting um, and we're talking of doing prints of some of the stills from it, which I, I, I've got some here <coughs> behind me. In fact, if you look there, there's one of them, a red one, but uh, all that's still coming along. Um, there's a book out about micro arts now, and that's getting a second edition quite soon through a different publisher. That's great, yeah. And maybe- so, I Yeah, that's about it really. I mean, um, there's a lot more on the website if anybody wants to have a look. 
which is um, microartsgroup.com. Yeah, and I'll add a, just a, a couple of things. So we've been talking about taking the micro arts work and producing an exhibition that will be installed at the BCS headquarters towards the end of the year, depends how things go. And then I would like to put together an event middle of next year, um, which would look at um, micro arts and other cre creativity with microcomputers. Um, I think that period, the 80s, because it introduced computers to and put them in people's homes, we, we often we think about games and we think about, um, us, but yes, Sinclair game, mostly games is what people think about, but there was a lot of creative work going on. And even those games had a lot of creative work, of course. So what I'd like to do for that event would be to see if I can bring um, some musicians, um, artists, game creators and so on together and have like a little bit of a showcase in Leicester towards the middle of next year. Um, and I'd need to get some Arts Council support for that, I think. But we'll certainly have the micro arts exhibition and towards the end of this year. And then hopefully we can take it somewhere else and it will become part of the archive. So a uh, very interesting project. Yeah, that sounds great. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, Any questions for anybody? <coughs> I just wanted to ask about the piece that is going to be part of the collection. Is that is that one of the micro? So um, you mentioned that one of your pieces will be part of the cast collection. Is that right? Or did I? I think I think the idea is all of it goes in because it was wow. a, because it was an organisation. Uh, there were a lot of people involved, and different people contributed different things. So I don't really want to put in one of my pieces in. I think the whole lot could go in as a collection of data cassettes. I suppose the original pieces, I mean, these, these things, you know, C15 computer cassette and so on. These are the backups uh, the magazine, you know, it's physical. That's also in the um, National Computer Museum already. They have a mag magazine archive there, huge magazine archive. Um, so I think all of it is, is of interest to somebody in the future, because if I'd have known about CAS at the time, you know, if it had been around, it might not even have happened. It might have just gone through them or something. Mm -hmm. Uh, I think Sean's aware of that. I mean, it's, at that time, it wasn't really operating. I think most people in computer graphics had got jobs because there was tons of work around. I mean, I went from COBOL programming to networking to Unix, uh, doing graphics. Seagal, I mentioned earlier with Steve Bell, uh, and then onto the web and then, you know, through into apps. And none of this operates in the sort of academic or art areas necessarily but the skills are the same. So I think there's a lot of people that are interested in the art side without being artists, which means the archive could be very popular. And there's no reason why it shouldn't become an educational resource. Absolutely. And I think on. some of the programs you use, you can, you can recode them and use them um, in Scratch or something else. And, but my hope is that this will actually give us a little focal point and we might start to uncover more work from the 80s. Mm, that, mm. Mm. currently is off the radar it's out there but it hasn't all been pulled together so um for me i think it's a very interesting focal point to start looking at that era 1980s microcomputers mm -hmm. from a creative perspective so uh it um, should be a good project yeah great thank you and i think we should move on actually the next speaker is oliver so um oliver's just been asking the question there um um yes. I can very briefly say about oliver and that he's a member of um, art in flux who um, have worked with Eva and Kaz for a number of years now and have brought a nice fresh um, perspective on computer art and digital art. So um, I'll hand over to you for, again, 10 minutes or so. Yeah, thank you so much, John. Yeah, um, for those of you who don't know us, hopefully a lot of you do, um, the three of us, Afra Shemze, Maria Almina and myself, we founded Art in Flux four years ago now at the Lights of Soho Gallery. And yeah, Flux is really set up as a forum, a platform for media artists to come together, explore ideas and exchange really um, our own practices and um, yeah, also discuss um, possibilities, strategies and um, ultimately also the technologies that we're all working with. Um, very briefly about Maria and Afra. Um, Maria's work is very much performative and she works a lot with this idea of um, transformative art um, with wearables um, and live performances um, using very often technology and um, this idea of embodiment and projection mapping. Afra is um, a, a light artist and sculpture um, that is working a lot in public spaces um, with this idea of participatory art and 
yeah, and uh, myself, I'm uh, also a researcher at the National Center for Computer Animation, um, where I'm doing yeah postdoctorate uh, research position, and I work um, mainly with brainwave art and this concept of presence, and um, also holographic projection, and um, also I'm part of an, a collective called Analemma Group. And today I want to just talk about one of the projects that I've recently done with Analemma Group and then about what we're now up to with Flux. So um, these are three examples of my work. So on the left-hand side, um, one of the early iterations of Kima, um, which is kind of a, a family of works really that was developed with Analemma Group. In the center, the oral piece, which is came out of my uh, doctorate at the Center for Digital Entertainment at Bournemouth University, and it's a brainwave triggered hologram that um, responds to your brainwaves that was exhibited actually with CAS um, at the EVA London conference two years ago. And to the right is um, a light art piece that is called Refraction as part of a series of light art pieces. Um, with Analemma Group, I've been working now for 10 years. So the collective was founded by my colleague Evgenia Emmets 10 years ago. And me, her, and Alan, the three of us, we've been working together for 10 years on this idea of um, visual sound in a lot of different ways. <clears throat> These are images from the Roundhouse installation that we had for the 50th anniversary of the Roundhouse, um, where the audience was invited to explore their own voice visually in um, six different zones. And that was the first time that we worked with machine learning algorithms, trying to understand kind of the nuances of the human voice um, in different ways. So the, the timbre and yeah, learning more and more as the piece developed really. And um, one of the various different developments of the schema project um, was shown actually at event two um, with CAS um, at, uh, a year ago, and um, also at the Great Exhibition Road Festival. So this is Kima the Voice, and it's one of these chapters. And the idea with this particular installation is that the audience is um, basically exploring the space between different performers, so between um, singers, between voices, it's about resonance, harmonies, um, and kind of mathematically analyzing really when two voices are harmonizing and then providing a visual display, a visual interface for performance. Oh, somebody is not muted. I can hear myself twice. Try that. Is that better? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, so this is actually a project that we just screen for the first time. So I can see him myself twice. I don't know why. Uh, mute everyone apart from you, and hopefully that will fix it. How's that? I think it's better. Yeah, <laughs> yeah so um, this project was developed last year um, at the Tate, at the Tate Exchange. It's called Kima Noise. And the idea here is um, to provide um, a tactile interface for the exploration of urban noises within a space. So the audience is invited to draw trajectories um, of noise and then to move the soundscapes around this kind of a three-dimensional sound sculpture. And that is accompanied by um, a, a real-time representation of these real-time streams from around the Tate that were projected onto these beautiful window displays at the Tate Exchange. Um, yeah, and we were working quite a bit with um, Professor Stephen Stansfield, who's here in the picture in the background, who's one of the lead experts on noise. And there's a film which was just premiered and which is going to premiere um, again. So we have a second screening on the 23rd of June, if you're interested in the project. But um, what I wanted to uh, quickly talk about is this a new development, which we showed um, just last week uh, at the National Gallery X which is um, our new partner, not just with an LMA group, but also with Flux. And the National Gallery X is a new space between the National Gallery and King's College London, supported by Google Arts and Culture. And we were supposed to have a big exhibition there. Um, unfortunately, the lockdown came, and so we took the installation online. And so now we're exploring three different pieces from the collection of the National Gallery. And the idea is for audiences at home to be able to explore these color palettes of some of the great masters um, through a 360 app. And it's, yeah, we're very happy with the outcome. It's actually very intuitive to use. It works via the YouTube app. And so the idea is um, to just use it for really and to navigate around in the space and explore these different um, 
alle Shades, alle Selections bei des um, uh, Masters, so uh, one Van Eyck, one Van Gogh and uh, a Monet that you can explore in 3D and it's a, a three-dimensional sound piece that goes with it and you're very much in uh, invited to explore it at home. It's free, it's accessible on the National Gallery website and you can do it on a computer but it doesn't really pay justice. So the idea is for you to really maneuver around um, through these color scapes ideally using um, the gyroscope on your, on, on your phone because it's just much more exciting if you can really direct your own experiences of colors. And yeah, it's very um, meditative and very beautiful, um, slow, slow pieces. And yeah, I'd, I'd encourage you to, to try it out at home to take a little bit of time to come into, into life, but um, something to, to just, um, explore in your own time, I guess. Yeah, so with the National Gallery X, we're also partnering with Flux. So they um, kindly invited us to host um, three events um, with them and uh, at their venue. And the first of which is happening already next week um, on the 16th of June. And um, this is part of our Flux virtual offering. So part of our um, development for this year, we've taken all of our activities with Flux online, including our socials, which are you know, forums for media artists really to come together, exchange ideas and um, talk about their practices. Um, but this event is a curated event. So um, we have um, three speakers, keynote speakers and various different demos, all working on the concept of gender and gender fluidity and media art. And um, I'm just going to very quickly um, present you with the speakers for next week because we'd love to see you there and it's free. <laughs> um, so uh, Dr. Paula Kalos is a researcher at the National Center for Computer Animation and she will be talking about Nigerian um, media artists and performance artists um, who are working with different media. Um, yeah, and also questions of accessibility to technology. Um, very, there's four different artists, very diverse practices. Um, Dr. Pikita Hosea is um, a, a performance artist and um, time-based media artist, um, also a researcher at um, the University of Creative Arts London. And um, yeah, she will be presenting various different pieces of her, um, of her own practice, um, including uh, these uh, new, new pieces. So one is called Media and Try On. And uh, Jake Alvis um, is a, um, an artist that works a lot with machine learning algorithms. And this piece, CZ, discusses alternative notions of beauty um, in the context of gender fluidity. And um, yeah, they're all machine learning generated um, animations, really um, fantastic work. And we'll be talking a bit about this and um, his other art practices. And we have demos by um, kind of a next generation of media artists, um, younger uh, artist, Ro Greenberg, um, is presenting um, a film which is called Down the Seafall Cliff, which is all about uh, gender transition and singing voices. So music artists um, who are going through gender transitions. Paul Kindersley um, is presenting a feature film and Priscilla Burrell is uh, presenting um, her work. Um, so um, all in the context of gender, media art, and also in the wider context, I guess, of the National Gallery and um, yeah, their, their collection. So we would love to see you there if you um, have time. It's, as I said, it's free of charge. Um, it's next week um, on the 16th, starting at 6.30. And um, I'm sure it's gonna be an interesting and eclectic mix of different speakers. And Maria has her social on the 30th um, of June, which is, um, yeah, ready for, for media artists to exchange ideas and come together and um, I, th I believe it will be all about collaborative practices, the next one. I think that's it for me. I hope I didn't wrap over too much. <laughs> yeah, that's great. Thank you. I wonder if you could send me um, the link to that YouTube video and any links to those events and I'll make sure they get shared amongst the group via uh, an email I'm sending out probably tomorrow and um, uh, on the Facebook page. Fantastic, yeah, we will do. Okay, thank you very much. Very interesting. Always busy. <laughs> um, okay, our next speaker um, is Graham Diprose from Eva. Um, 
Graham, I think you've probably heard us talking about EVA quite a bit. I meant it'll come up in conversations. It's the annual conference, EVA London, um, that the Computer Arts Society, um, I, I guess we would say runs, although um, Graham will explain the um, uh, relationship between the organisations, I'm sure. Um, and it was due to happen in um, July, but of course it's not. So I think Graham hopefully will give us an update on what the plans might be for the next um, EVA event. So Graham, over to you for a bit. Can I see, is Graham there? Oh, I think you're muted actually, Graham. <laughs> um, right, okay, I'm unmuted at my end. Okay, great, fine. Back with us. Good, oh, I'm back with you, that's useful. <laughs> right, okay, uh, for anyone who doesn't know, EVA London is an international conference of digital art. Um, it is part of the Computer Arts Society, uh, which is part of the British Computer Society, so that's really the way the link-up works. Um, it's quite a large conference in terms of, uh, it's been going a long time, it's been, it was supposed to be its 30th birthday this summer, and we'd planned all sorts of very exciting uh, developments uh, and, and events for the lovely uh, anniversary. And all of these have had to uh, obviously um, be postponed or cancelled or whatever. Um, it's quite ironic to think that on the 24th of February, I looked up the date, I was sitting with Oliver and Afra and Maria planning to put a flux exhibition up at the BCS uh, over and uh, we're changing the pictures on the 12th of April over Easter. Uh, and uh, that sure as hell didn't happen. So that was how quickly all the plans changed. Now, we had a problem in EVA because we had already peer-reviewed over 70 authors' papers from all over the world, uh, and uh, we had agreed to publish them and so on and so forth, and suddenly we couldn't have a conference. So how on earth do you actually continue to publish papers when you can't afford to pay for pay for doing it and that was our, that was our issue many of our authors are people who have been around either for lots of years you know 10 years 20 years and they were relying on this particular publication let's say for um, grants for uh, um, applications to um, uh, for, for PhD uh, defenses uh, for reviews that were coming up for, into research this, this autumn, and so on and so forth. So they were all desperate to be published. So what we did was we came up with something called an author's package. We calculated how much it would cost to put everyone's papers up on Science Open, which doesn't come cheap, but is well worthwhile because it is the finest academic website we know of, and also to print it in the full hard copy paper proceedings that we've always done. <clears throat> we knew we could put it on Science Open probably around July sometime because that's something that people can do online from their own home. We have no idea really when we can actually get a printed proceeding in our hands. So we're having a guess and saying September, we hope. But of course, the catch is that no one will be at a conference to pick up their, their copy of the proceedings and take it home with them. So part of, the, uh, part of the package for authors we had to put together was that we will put them in a jiffy bag and post them all over the world to every author. And this was what we came up with. Initially, we had some emails in from people saying that's a lot of money and how dare you and all the rest of it. Uh, once we explained what it cost to put money up, put, a, put papers on Science Open and uh, to print proceedings and so on and so forth, we had a hundred percent take up. There wasn't one single author or one single paper that wasn't paid for by the author's package. Now this has been very, very good because this has allowed us to actually publish everyone's work and it will also help to pay Computer Arts Society funds for next year. 
Um, we have found various ways and means that I won't go into right now of um, ensuring that the Computer Arts Society will have some funding next year from EVA, which BCS see as its major form of funding. Um, but yes, we've done it. We've actually achieved that. We're saying it will be printed by September. If there was a second wave or something, it might be later. But what else could we do? What I didn't want to do was to get the, get the BCS printers to feel obliged to go in in the middle of a pandemic and try and print our proceedings. They are very pleased with us because we've come up with this because an awful lot of other organisations as, e, as part of BCS have simply closed down, given up and all the rest of it. So I was asked last week to write a best practice um, email uh, to BCS for them to show other organisations how we did it. So that's, that's quite nice. Anyway, okay, so plan B. We have booked three days in BCS Moorgate from the 16th to 18th of November. And what form that conference will take, your guess is as good as mine. And we'll be able to tell you more probably in early September when we see where we're at, whether we see where the universities are going back, whether we see that uh, air travel is happening, uh, whether hotels are available and all the rest of it. And we'll make a judgment on that. We can actually run the thing the way we've run all our previous EVAs with us all sitting there in rows next to each other. Uh, we can run it more or less in a, dare I say, the one show format with two or three speakers, uh, two or three chairs actually introducing stuff and then running a mixture of YouTubes and presentations. We can run it like this because obviously with Sean and with what Flux do, we have the capability of running it that way if we needed to. So those are really all our options. And when we get to the 16th and 18th of November, Monday to Wednesday, we'll see what we're going to be able to do at the time. <clears throat> we're hoping that next year will change and will be better. Your guess is again, again as good as mine. So next October, there will be a call for, um, for proposals for EVA 2021 in the normal way. The deadline for that is like the second week in January. It is then peer reviewed and we are planning to run EVA 2021 from the 5th to the 9th of July next year. Uh, it may run 5th to the 10th as a possibility of some other bits and pieces. It's a damn shame because we'd actually got some fantastic events booked for this summer, uh, working with all the people who we work with on event two, working with Flux, working with the Lumen Prize, working with the VNA, working with the RCA. And uh, we'll see what we can do in July 2021 and hope that we can. Um, so far as exhibitions go, uh, Obviously, we have to wait and see when BCS can open up in Moorgate and when people can go in. Um, there's no point really in putting on an exhibition there until we're confident that it's going to be seen by a fair number of footfall and a fair number of people. And none of the exhibitions that we have in mind, one of them is uh, working with Jeff on, on, on an exhibition of his work. One of them is an exhibition of Eva um, historic from the last five years of uh, artworks that have been inspired by academic papers from Eva and one of them is a, a really lovely show that we want Flux to put on at the BCS and blow all the computer the, the computer security guys minds away with what we're doing. We'll have to wait and see what we do and uh, it, this is still all for negotiating and all for seeing where we're at. But basically, uh, EVA London has run online proceedings wise and hopefully we'll be able to have speakers and an event like this in November, possibly with some of us sitting two metres apart from each other or one metre apart from each other or even sharing the same glass of wine. That's it. <laughs> Thank you, Graham. Thanks for the update. Um, for me, I, I must have been to the last 
not my first EVA. Maybe I'm heading on towards 10 years, actually, of EVA attendance. Mm. And I've always found it a really valuable sort of middle of year point for me to either present some new work or to find things out. So I'm, I'm hoping that it will get back to normal next year and that we'll have um, a, a fun again. Um, that's great. OK, now our final speaker, um, Terry Trickett, is a regular presenter at EVA and gave a very interesting um, talk last year, I recall, about cybernetic art. Um, now, I know today you're going to give us a short talk followed by a, a video of a performance. Um, so I, I look forward to seeing that. I haven't, apart from the little preview I saw earlier, I haven't seen the whole video. Um, and then after Terry's talk, I'll just give you a few updates about um, uh, the plans for these ongoing talks and so on. So Terry, over to you. Thanks, Sean. Um, hello, everybody. It's, um, as Sean says, um, I've met some of you at the EVA conferences, and uh, I'll come back to that part of my life um, in a few seconds. Um, but I think it's very interesting, these events, because, um, well, go back to Jeff's talk just for the moment. Um, he, he provides uh, sort of glimpses or remembrances of the past. And it made me think, as he was talking, well, what was I doing then? Um, now, for instance, uh, he, he talked about his time in the, working at the Prudential, um, which is a very fine building, by the way, but I don't know it very well, but I always like the look of it. And I realized at exactly the same time that he was working in the Prudential, I was, um, working in the city, installing dealing rooms for many well-known companies. Um, some of you will remember that that was the time of Big Bang. And Big Bang absolutely transformed the city, almost overnight. And um, the city as it was pre-85 is nothing like the city as it is now. In fact, you walk around and you find that virtually every building in the city is post-85. Um, the reason I sort of take an interest in all this is because I now live in the city, uh, in the Barbican. Um, in, a, in other words, in, 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 in my retirement, I've gradually moved closer and closer. Rather than moving out to a country mansion, I've moved to a, uh, a high-level uh, flat in the Barbican from where I can... Um, peer over the uh, the world and the city, which is what I like doing, by the way. But it also made me think, because um, recently I've written another article, not for an EVA event, but for something else. And um, I've called it Patterns of Existence. Um, it's actually patterns as I see them, as they've influenced me. Um, it's uh, patterns which, which from the neural to the musical and the cosmic um, to the architecture. I can't remember exactly the title I gave it, but it sort of sums up how the linking um, sort of um, um, aspect of my life is not just playing the clarinet, which is something you're going to hear in a minute on this video that Sean mentioned. That's been one linking factor in the whole of my life. The, others, the other has been patterns. And the reason for that, because, and by the way, I know that the same applies to most of you. Um, the reason for that is that architects um, are sort of possessed by geometry. Um, when, whenever they sketched with a pencil, because we, we still use pencils, by the way, um, it's always um, geometric and it's always precisely in scale. Because for me, because I grew up in the imperial um, time of times, not the metric times, if I do a sketch of a building or a sketch of a plan, it's always perfectly to eighth scale, quarter scale or half inch scale. And I can't change that. That's that's the way it will always be. Um, and I'm because some of you were um, doing what I'm doing um, 
holding forth with a stream of consciousness. Uh, this has caused me to remember something else which uh, came up when I was writing this paper. Um, what you may remember that the word computer didn't in the 50s and late 40s, it didn't mean this machine that sat on your desk because most of the time they weren't there. A computer was a person. If you remember, in, in pre-Turing times, um, uh, he would have called um, people working in the city, um, number crunching, counting checks. Um, he would have called them computers. And it was only later that it became this awkward machine that sat unhappily on people's desks and caused them considerable ergonomic problems. And most of my life has been spent dealing with problems that were caused by computers in buildings and how they affected people's environments and their health and well-being. That's another common strand. Now, coming to this subject, I have got a watch here, so I'm being a bit careful. Um, last year, I, at an EVA conference, in fact, I was just beginning to think um, about a new piece of visual music that I was going to create. Because Sean has mentioned that uh, he came to um, my talk at uh, EVA last year, which was on, um, I called it a, um, a cybernetic clarion call to the arts community. It was indeed about cybernetics, which I know is of great interest to Sean. And it's great interest to me because I was a very early exponent of cybernetics. It started in America, um, but it arrived in the UK quite early, 50s, 60s. And in fact, we took it up really to a greater extent than people in the USA, because we applied it. Think of Roy Ascot, who, who David mentioned. He applied it to art. And he discovered this book in the library at Newcastle, which was by somebody called Stafford Beer, uh, which was a treatise on um, uh, cybernetics. And Roy Ascot, it influenced his whole life. He, he managed to apply the principles of cy cybernetics to the arts community. That was a major achievement, which set his pattern for life, which he has never deviated from. Um, you can tell this is the real stream of consciousness. Um, anyway, the reason I'm mentioning Eva now last year is not because of the paper that I gave, but I suddenly realized what my next piece of visual music was going to be. And I knew that I wanted it to use deep dream images. If you remember last year at the Barbican, there was the AI exhibition, which was a very successful exhibition, a very good one. And although I'd seen deep dream images before, um, it was at that exhibition that I, I looked at them closely. Some of you will know that um, it was designed, it was invented only a few years ago as a piece of technology by Sorry, the, Russian, the Russian person whose name I can't remember, who worked for Google. And if you remember, Sean, he talked at event two when the Lumen had their conference and um, they announced their shortlist at event two at the Royal College. This Russian lad uh, gave a talk to us about how he had discovered deep dreaming. Um, and if you remember, um, it, he described it as a complete accident. That's another thing that's always happened to me. Everything has happened by accident. Anyway, the, the, this Russian Google person had discovered deep dreaming by accident. He was an artist employed to work at Google. Um, and it made a great big impression on me. The only thing that's strange about deep dreaming is that everything that he dreamed looked like a Chagall painting. And I wanted to make certain that the things that I deep dream didn't necessarily come out like a Chagall painting. So when I show you a piece of video, I'm going to show you, let me show you um, some stills first. Yeah, that should be it.
Hi, Terry. Um, Sean, I, get, I didn't mute myself. I was oh, talking. Okay. Uh, something happened, you were muted. But anyway, you're back now. I'm you? back. Yeah. I don't know what happened. Anyway, <laughs> now, um, the, 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 the piece of music is called Passaggiata. Uh, we'll call that a walk, an amble, um, a walk of discovery. Um, and these are my deep dreaming images. On one side, you'll see patterns. I've been talking about patterns. And it was I used those patterns to train the images that you see on the other side. The ones which look hopefully slightly dreamy and slightly out of focus and a little bit like a passaggiata that might have happened in the hillsides of Italy. Because that's, that was actually what happened. Uh, I, had, I took some snapshots um, when I was walking just above the mountains of Genoa. And um, it was a three hour walk and I got completely lost. Um, and then coming back now to last summer at Eva, when I knew I was going to create a piece of music which was all about deep dreaming, I also knew that the music that I was going to use was by Luciana Berio, um, a, a, a very experimental Italian composer who um, is dead now, um, but he wrote a piece in, in 1980, which was called Sequenza 9A for solo clarinet. Um, at a technical level, it's probably the most difficult piece that's ever been written for the clarinet. And he didn't care about difficulties because every one of his sequenzas was an investigation into instrumental sound. So he was never satisfied with what instruments could do. He wanted to, or did do, he wanted to know what they could do if he really stretched people to the limit. So that was, if you like, the musical side. And deep dreaming is also the visual side where you're also stretching the way of creating images as far as you possibly can. Now, um, I'm, I am keeping a look on this watch. So what I'm going to do now is to show you or show you a piece of what emerged from all this. Here we are. You have got the beginnings of Perseggiata on the screen now. And I'm, I'm just going to give you a few minutes. I, I'll, I'll talk a little bit as it's playing. I now view Passaggiata as a paradigm of the times in which we now live. And the reason is that I see in uh, Berio's music times of calm times of calm and equilibrium, and as you'll discover soon, times of extreme chaos. In other words, it sums up, it sums up to me where we are at the moment, poised, teetering on the edge of chaos. You might say that's a bit extreme. But what I say is that lockdown does make you think in a very strange way. You've heard me talking in quite a incoherent way about things that I've done in the past. Now I'm hoping that this visual music I'm hoping it isn't incoherent. I'm hoping it actually is somehow a reflection of what we've been through in the last few months. Thank you. 
That's one of Berio's experiments, using harmonics. Now he lived in these villages that I was walking around, which is why I chose them for this piece. That's getting a little bit more like the Chagall images, which the Russian used to get. Now it's becoming chaotic. It's where the, the patterns go mad and chaotic. That will just give you a glimpse. That's about um, a third of the piece. Um, it was going to be the basis of the performance I was going to give at, give at Eva in a few days' time, which of course won't happen. I was also going to give a, a version of it in Eva in Florence, which would have happened last month. And the month before that, I was going to perform it in Sri Lanka. Now, Sure, you all know that all those events have been cancelled, um, but I'm sure there'll be an equal number of events coming up very soon. What worries me is that most of them are scheduled for November. Mm -hmm. how, it, how November is going to turn out, I just don't know. Anyway, thank you very much for listening and looking. Thank you very much, Terry. I think it was really insightful for you to just speak over it, actually. Just, <laughs> uh, that was, for me, that was really good. It's great. I, is there a link to the entire piece somewhere? I'm going to give you, I'll send you the, um, the YouTube link. Yeah. Okay, fine. Yeah, great. Okay, well, um, I think what first we should do is thank all of our speakers. A little round of applause. <laughs> well done to everyone. Um, I think another great set of talks, actually. Very interesting. Um, I could see connections between them and so on, which is always nice. So that, that's brilliant. Um, Okay, we're, we're coming up towards about um, half nine, where I said um, we'd aim to finish. Um, has anybody got any burning questions they would like to ask? I don't see anyone waving. Okay, well, um, uh, all the speakers, if they want to send me any um, links to include with um, the recording, um, so obviously Terry, your video, um, Yes. as well web addresses i'll pop those into the video recording which will go online um, probably tomorrow <coughs> and that will represent the end of um this second series of cas talks which i think has been a really interesting one again um as mentioned i think the next series will actually be in august and that will give me a little bit of time to focus on a, a few other things and also to um confirm the speakers so everyone who has registered with this um 
uh, with the Zoom link is on a mailing list. And what I will do is I will send out a little summary of the se second season together with um, the links and so on that I talked about. And then probably in July, I will send out another email to let you know what the plans are for what will be season three. I'll also post it, of course, on the CAS um, email list and on the, um, the website. So um, you can have a little break from CAS talks, but don't worry, they are going to come back. Um, and then the, the final thing really to say is that I've work, been working with um, my sort of local artist community on a project that we're calling Digital Arts Leicester. And I'm just going to paste the address into the chat. And we have an opening event on Friday. Um, if you're interested in coming along, join, uh, sign up on Eventbrite, which the link has in there. And then we'll be sharing the address um, probably on Thursday. And it will actually be a YouTube broadcast. Um, and that will include a walkthrough of the exhibition and then some uh, uh, audiovisual performances as well. It's about a two hour event. And that marks the start of this Leicester event and there'll be a following Friday event and a following Friday event and a few other things as well. I'm, I'm doing a education workshop and so on, but maybe have a look at, I'm going to get the main address. And I shall just copy that. So maybe have a little look at that. And if you're interested in seeing some of the things that happen in my local digital art scene, that would be great. Um, otherwise, we'll look at reconnecting again um, in the, well, I suppose it's in the summer, isn't it? But we're almost in the summer now, really. Later in the summer. <laughs> okay. So um, thank you all very much for attending. And particularly thanks for all the speakers and um, some great talks there. I hope you all agree. Um, thank you. And um, thank you. I think... Thank you, Sean. Thank you very much. And um, I'll say goodbye. Yeah. Bye, Sean. Lovely. Yeah. That's great. Thank you. Yeah. See you before too long. <laughs> Bye.